Hello and welcome to another episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. Now today we are lucky enough to have a repeat guest on the show, somebody who we love having on the Practical Stoic and somebody who I'm sure many of you have already been following in all of her books and uh, interviews in various places, but uh, none other than Professor Nancy Sherman. Now, one of the reasons why she's on the show today is because she has a brand new book out called Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. And I was fortunate enough to read an early copy before it was printed, and I highly recommend that you go out there and grab yourself a copy. I know that you're going to love it. And uh, I'm going to put links in the show notes for where you can get yourself a copy. And no matter where you buy it, please make sure that you give it a positive review so that more people can find their way to this work. So, uh, if you haven't heard of Nancy Sherman before, then I am going to give you a little bit of a biography so that you know who we're talking to, and then we'll dive straight into the interview. So, Nancy Sherman is a university professor and professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. Sherman is a New York Times notable author. Her books include After War, The Untold War, Stoic Warriors, and now Stoic Wisdom. From 1997 to 1999, she served as the inaugural holder of the Distinguished Chair in Ethics at the U.S. Naval Academy, designing and teaching the Brigade-Wide Military Ethics course and laying the groundwork for the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. Sherman has research training in psychoanalysis from the Washington Psychoanalytic Institute and regularly consults with military and veterans groups in the US and abroad on issues of ethics, moral injury, and post-traumatic stress. And to add a cherry on top of this cake, Nancy Sherman holds a PhD from Harvard University. So, with that all said, and without any further ado, I present to you my interview with our repeat guest... Nancy Sherman. Nancy, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, obviously, we've had many fascinating conversations before, but this time we have a, a new arrival on the scene, Stoic Wisdom. And thank you so much for putting this book together. And I guess I want to uh, firstly throw it over to you. Uh, you know, it's been a while since we last spoke. Talk to me about the book. Talk to me about everything that you've been up to since, uh, since last time. Well, a pandemic has occurred, and <laughs> I happen really? to <laughs> maybe maybe it didn't get to the Sun Coast in Australia. Uh, you might say that it didn't because we're pretty safe over here. I, I always feel guilty talking to anybody outside of Australia because we're just here at the beach, and everybody else yeah, is still just... dealing with it. But <laughs> yes, yes, I know you got it light. Um, I have colleagues in Australia. Yeah. Um, that said. Uh, a serendipitously timed uh, sabbatical um, that was just coming up, and it was uh, January 20, uh, 2020, essentially, to uh, mm. December 2020. And uh, I uh, had a book on the in the works, at least a, a proposal that was accepted and under contract, but I never thought uh, it would materialize in the way it did. And I felt I was... Um, it, it was a mission. I, I mean, and it was, uh, it wrote itself. That's the best way I can mm. put it. There are a few, you know, I've written maybe six, seven books. This one kind of wrote itself. Um, and that was, I think many of us have li been living very undistracted lives. Um, you know, not jumping on planes, uh, not giving mm. talks. Um, if you're an academic, um, you're often giving talks here and there. And um, also not commuting, you know, not going back and forth in the day-to-day -day, uh, commute of life. So uh, I missed my family, that is my greater family. My children live far away um, on the West Coast of the United States, and there was no way I could see them. But in the midst of all that, there was a micro wedding. My daughter got married um, and we did a, car, a road trip. I've never driven across this vast expanse of land mm -hmm. um, in a pandemic. I've never lived through a pandemic. No one in our generation has lived through a pandemic. No one's old enough, really. Um, mm. Very few to have gone through the 1918 um, pandemic. And um, I think stoic lessons were on my mind, um, as well as thinking about uh, how to the inequities of the world, um, racial reckoning in our country, um, um, disparities across the globe. So all that was yeah. bubbling as I thought about ancient texts. I had taught stoicism 
as I signed off um, fall 2019 in a graduate seminar with some fellow faculty members from other lo uh, re regional universities. And so it was on my mind, the, the texts were sort of fresh, um, yeah. but it, it kind of came together. That's yeah. what I've been up to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're glad for that. And, and, you know, I, I'm going to ask a selfish question, which might not necessarily relate to the, what the content of the book, but I'm, I'm interested. You say, you know, the book wrote itself. Um, what, what is, what is the writing process like for you? How do you structure your, your time? How do you structure your kind of creative time and, and how does it all kind of come together? I don't think there's any easy answer as a teacher in the humanities, uh, and I'll be honest, my husband's a mathematician and, and I do not have that skill set. Mm. Um, I do feel the thing I can teach my students is what I learned the hard way through you know, 90, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration, they say, mm. is to write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And mm. um, maybe this was a little less so. Uh, I. I mean, I knew, I, I knew that I wanted to see the Stoics in the way that I've always seen them, as inheriting a problem that um, Aristotle gave them. So, and I've lived with Aristotle most of my adult life. That's real mm. where, where um, my graduate studies began. And I've written a lot on Aristotle. I've written a lot on the emotions. So all of that was in the background. And mm. so I had a lot of the nuts and bolts, you might say, the scholarship. Hmm. My task was not to be a wonky scholar, you might say. <laughs> I, hmm. wasn't re I wasn't writing for my fellow classical philosophers. Um, there's plenty of that stuff out in the scholarly journals. But on the other hand, I wanted to be truthful and faithful to a tradition of scholarship. I mean, that's who I am. I am hmm. I'm not a, you know, a pop guru figure. Yep. You may be, but I'm not. <laughs> um, and I want, you know, there's enough of that out there. I mm. wanted to really make the Stoics talk, but make the difficult technical stuff um, be answering problems that were our problems of uh, figuring out. You always have to figure out as a exegeticist or you know a, a, an explorer of text how do you deal with the past that's just mm. that is always a problem and so um and things were on my mind I have to say a pandemic was on my mind being mm. how was I going to see my children my daughter wanted to have a wedding how is she going to have a wedding how are mm. we going to get out to California um who is going to be tested how many were going to be you know how are we going to get tested PCR tests fast test. It all had to be PCR. Where was I going to get? We live in United States of America. There's 50, you know, plus, and you don't have a health plan in one place. It's there. And so all of this stuff um, of getting tested and being safe, there was a lot of anxiety. And so stoicism was sort of bubbling in the background. How it wrote itself in, a, you know, teaching, I, I, you know, once I had organized it, um, and I had many uh, places where I wanted to pop things and topics I wanted to take on and texts that just had to talk. Mm. I love Seneca. I like, I love Seneca's plays. They weren't dealt with. I knew I wanted, if I was talking about soldiers, I wanted to talk about moral injury and soldiering. Where was I going to put that? So I think that's sort of how it happened. And I write and write, rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And I had a great editor who also mm. rewrote, and I'm now working with a, um, you know, a major newspaper in the, in the, in the States for a, um, an opinion piece, a guest essay. And I thought, we edited a lot. Let me tell you what major news are, uh, papers, how they edit. They go through mm. many, many hands of editorial review. And yeah. so, you know, I, I, I tell my students that it's, it's not a walk in the park, but yeah. you know, it's, it's wonderful. So I yeah. know if that helps. That's no, it definitely not. helps. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and you met, you mentioned um, Aristotle. You men, mentioned Seneca's plays. I wanted to touch on both of those uh, areas today. Now, one I, I think, uh, as you might agree, one of the interesting differences that we see between Aristotle and the the Stoics is obviously that Aristotle 
takes the good life a little bit further than the Stoics do, or you might say that the Stoics take it a little bit further than he does, but um, the, the idea that, you know, the good life also has to have an element of good fortune. You might, you might say beauty or good fortune in your society. Aristotle might say that you need a little bit of that, right, to, to have the good life, whereas the Stoics probably would have said, no, 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 you need to draw it as close to you as possible within your control. Where do you sit on that kind of spectrum between the good life having a few elements of that good societal success, you might say, and, and drawing it into what the Stoics would have said, you know, it, don't rely on anything that can be given or taken from you sort of thing. If, yeah. So the, the Stoics definitely wanted much brighter stripes than Aristotle could offer. And to mm. my mind, one of Aristotle's great, uh, why he's so exciting to my mind is that he, he makes you think about this stuff and tells you these are hard choices and you're going to have mm. to figure out how much prosperity, how little, what you can deal with in order to actualize his term, um, mm. realize uh, uh, the excellence that you have. It's not, he inherited from a, a problem Plato gave him that uh, virtue was in possession, not in use for Aristotle, it's in use. So if mm. it's exercised, um, and not just a dormant capability, then you need opportunity, occasion, luck, and mm. a fair and certain amount of it. That makes the good life vulnerable. And he's all too aware of it. Priam, mm. probably the end of his life, didn't have a shot at happiness because he lost you know, his sons in the Trojan War. Mm. And so there was a terrific reversal of fortune, he says. A great, great misfortune can undo your chances for happiness. Mm. The Stoics don't like that. You know, they'd rather have the say, you know, the, the, the sage tortured on the rack is still happy. To most of us, including Aristotle, that's crazy. Hmm. To be tortured on the rack, to spend 20 years in Guantanamo, uh, seven and a half years in the Hanoi Hilton, as Stockdale did, is not to flourish. The, the, that I think that is a common sense view. The Stoics are sort of, do they bite the bullet? I actually don't think they bite the bullet and say, yes, it is. I've, so I don't believe that they retreat fully inward. I don't take, I think Epictetus is a kind of uh, full of a lot of shock and awe at mm -hmm. times. Um, but rather, I think they now, they, they, this is an opportunity for a new word. And we won't have external goods. We, which are these um, maybe subordinate goods to virtue in a flourishing life, rather, mm. we'll call them indifference with the TS. You're not indifferent, it's, you don't have an attitude of indifference to them, but rather you're going to develop new approach and avoidance behaviors to them. And your approach mm. behavior will be not acquisitive. Don't give in to the um, grabby, uh, impulsive um, uh, uh, kinds of attachments that are out there. And your aversive behavior or the withdrawing behavior is don't be panically, don't, you know, have panic aver panicky aversion. Rather, mm. a cautious, cautious, a rational caution, a kind of hesitancy, but not a panicked fear. And so they have a, the goods are all out there still, but your task is to think of them, you might say in kind of cheap language, they won't make or break your happiness. That's still pretty extreme. I think if mm. you were to tell me tomorrow that both my kids died and my husband died in a plane crash, I would almost be ready to pack it up. It would be mm. very hard to go on. I'd figure out ways probably, but it would not be uh, an easy walk in the park. Yeah. And so they realize this is just a slow, slow moral progress. If you want to call it moral or psychological of learning new behavior patterns that allow you, we might say maybe not to be phobic. That's not quite right. Cause that's a kind of modern term that has mm. pathology associated with it, but not to have panicky aversion or sticky attachment. I kind of like that language. That's very mm. close to what their own, their own is. And that's, and so the indifference, you should prefer the ones according to nature. So health over disease, 
um, prosperity over absolute poverty, um, uh, healthy children over diseased children, and so on. Hmm. But and you should disprefer the opposites. But that's not going to be case all the time. So in philosophy, we say there are types and tokens. In general, health over disease, but sometimes in the particular case, the token, disease over health. If being healthy means you have to kowtow to a tyrant and do horrific things, then better to be prefer hmm. disease. That's one of the examples they give. So yeah. they have a compli- it's a complicated philosopher's dance. You know, Mm. and you have to like to dance kind of intricately a little bit uh, Mm. over complex ideas. But, you know, it's not that complex. But that's the that's the gist. So I don't think they say retreat inward, you know, become the real servitude is outside and the real liberation is inside. I mean, they they're forced to go that way on occasion. But I do think they understand that they're living in a public political world. um, And uh, it's stormy for the Romans, especially. And they're trying actually, uh, the Greeks are trying to figure out this problem that Aristotle gave them. How do you deal with, uh, how do you make virtue stable and enduring? The Greek is manimas kaibabaya, stable and enduring, when the exercise of it is so subject to what's outside you. Yeah, yeah. No, I really like the language that you're using in terms of uh, changing your kind of approach as you move towards these sorts of things. And I like the language of the, the kind of don't be too sticky, right? <laughs> and 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 don't be too 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 grasping as well. Um, one thing that I really like about Seneca's philosophy uh, is I'm going to paraphrase terribly, but one thing that he says was if if money and good fortune is going to allow me to amplify my virtue then he basically says give me as much of it as you want right but and and so in that way he's he, it seems as though he's kind of saying the vessel for the wealth needs to be the thing that you change and then when when you do have that wealth you will be prepared to use it in a good and virtuous way you might say is that is that also your kind Very of reading yeah, and that's straight out mm. of Aristotle in some ways. You're regulating yeah. any external goods through your mm. virtue or through wisdom. Real yeah. wisdom for the Stoics is wise selecting. It's mm. wise preferring and wise dispreferring. And if you're not a sage, it's in a fitting way. And if you're a sage, it's in the, you know, taka formata, in exactly the right way or something like to that effect. So it, it's fitting or hits the mean, you might say, if Mm. you are regulating it exactly right. And as you say, regulating it so it's subordinated to the principles of virtue. But if you're just, you know, pile it on and let me use it for self-interest, then no, that's horrific. But there could be cases, and this is the, you know, this is where the rub is, I think, where there really are external structures that fully and thoroughly inhibit your being able to uh, flourish in the world and in fact be virtuous. My students recently read Primo Levi, Survival in Auschwitz. They saw um, I'm Not Your Negro, uh, James Baldwin's um, m- uh, memoir that was turned into a documentary. Uh, we live on a campus where there are 272 Uh, enslaved persons in 1838 sold by the Jesuit priests to finance the campus my students live on and I teach Mm. for those that were educated in the in Jesuit education I have to say this was a hard a hard truth for them to bear there were a lot of tears Mm. in class Um, and if, if I was to say to them retreat inward it's what you make of the world it's not what it's thrown at you at all well, they did. They say that that's what Epictetus is saying. Forget it. I don't want it. If it's about selfishness, I don't want it. I mean, it was just yesterday we were reading this book. You know, the, mm. the skinny is that. You know, and I was trying to show them in terms of this book what it, how I thought you could interpret it, and it, it acquiescence, inner citadel retreat. That's not 
to my mind, how to be a socially responsible individual, nor is it the connectedness and the social tissue that I see the Stoics really talking about. The Stoics early on, you know, Marcus Aurelius, whatever you make of him, he's not a great philosopher. I'll <laughs> He's a he maybe a great leader, but you know these are this would be stuff that you'd pick up here and there and here and there and you jot down, mm-hmm. and you know that's what he was doing at night. He was he was sort of remembering what he had learned and he mm-hmm. jotted it down. And one of the things that he had learned, probably through through Epictetus, but it came to Epictetus through Zeno and um, um, and the others, uh, Cleantes and Chrysippus was that, especially Zeno, because he writes a Republic that we don't really have anymore, is that we are connected to each other through shared reason. And Mm. as Marcus sort of puts it very graphically, I think probably the battlefield on his mind, if you cut a limb off from the trunk, a part or a limb, it's as if you're cutting, and you're a human being, it's as if you're cutting yourself off from the whole of which you are a part. Hmm. You are you are losing the whole, and I. That's a very early statement of the fact you and I are a, a globe away, just about, and there's a sense of connection. We hmm. we happen to speak English, thanks to colonialism <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and um, the British. But um, you know, in both of our in both of our countries. Um, hmm. But that said, we are. If we even spoke different languages, we would bring an interpreter and we would be able to use our reason to connect. And I, that's what the, Sto- the Stoics were kind of beginning to understand, that we mm. are crossing the divide through reason. And Aristotle didn't get that. You know, the earlier folks didn't get that because the, the door stopped at your border. It yeah. was the, the, po- the polis and everyone outside said, ba, ba, ba. They didn't speak Greek. And they were barbarians. Mm. That's the origin of the term barbarian. They speak ba ba ba. And mm. so I think the, you know, it's not the only strand in Stoicism by any means. They're struggling with a lot of things. How to be, how to understand self-sufficiency, a term they get early on from Socrates and, and Plato and Aristotle, how to understand that and, um, and flourish or be mm. eudaimon, uh, have a happy life. Um, but also how to stay connected um, through shared reason. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and you know, I, I, I also don't get the sense from the Stoics that their version of self-reliance is a purely selfish pursuit. I, don't, I, I, I know that, that it comes off like that in a lot of circles, I, and, and I might have used to think, I, I used to think about it in a different way, but the more I've studied the Stoics, I've realised that it is, um, it is a very, uh, it's, it seems selfish on the outskirts, but when you look deeper into the idea, it's actually a very selfless way of living in that, you know, the kind of idea is, well, look, if everybody took care of what they could take care of about themselves and their life and, and their internal world, would we all be more capable of taking care of each other? because we're putting ourselves together first, then you put your family together, then you put your you know, community together, that sort of thing. And I'm wondering, um, I understand what you're saying in terms of uh, sometimes there are these external things that can really get in the way of our flourishing. And then you have something like Seneca talking about the, uh, the, the, the way that if you die an honourable death, Right. He, he really thinks about this, this, this question of what is an honorable death? What does it mean to die honorably? And then he gives us that example of, say, the, uh, the Spartan sage, uh, no, not the Spartan sage, the Spartan uh, slave, sorry, uh, who, uh, when he's ordered to do his first task, he runs against the wall and cracks his head and, and kills himself, right, saying, I will not be a slave. And to Seneca, that was kind of like an unadulterated commitment to the uh, to a, a kind of virtue of living in that I will not be forced by anything external to me to do anything that I do not believe is true, right, and virtuous. I wonder what you think of that kind of idea, because for Seneca, it was kind of like virtuous all the way to the end, even if you have to choose going out. What do you what do you what do you think of that? 
It's not how Seneca himself lived, <laughs> because he <laughs> lived in very, very dirty, he swam in very dirty waters, mm. and he knew the uh, challenges of compromise mm. every day, every day yeah. and the challenge of accepting at the very end enforced suicide or forced suicide. Mm. Um, and uh, so I think he's, we all live in messy worlds. Every mm. one of us. There's no world in which we uh, don't face conflict. I mean, they may not be rise to the level of like hard, hard conflicts where they're mutually exclusive, but it, contingently in the sense that I can't do both these things at the same time. One mm. of my students is worried about, a, you know, a problem maybe Nietzsche or Kierkegaard, I can't remember. But anyway, you know, monk or, or the woman I love, you know, and you can't do both. <laughs> and um, and and that's a you know maybe in some other world he could but there's not you, you can't make these worlds work in 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 a finite life mm. and i think we make these decisions all the time and so i i actually don't buy a rigid um sense of honor i mean mm. i've been around military long enough to know how people are squeezed and constrained and the honorable for them is is they still have to follow rules of engagement. They may not agree when they're, they get stuck in a war that seems just in the beginning, but then isn't so just afterwards. At least the mm. mission changes, if not the actual overarching cause. Um, boy, they, you know, it, it, uh, they're looking at, at targets that seem just fine. And then, you know, they drop a huge bomb, as I sort of talk about in the book, and wasn't so fine because there was grainy imaging at the very last moment and only afterwards. So I think the world's a really, really messy place. So I'm not, I don't think of it that way. I mm. don't think black and white and think, I think, I think gray much more of the time yeah. and mess, messy and, uh, and not tidy. And that doesn't mean, you know, and so I don't think of, uh, I think of, um, I think of virtue. And I think this is a stoic advantage. Virtue isn't rigidity virtue is a, adaptiveness and that's how i think of resilience as adaptive in not in the sense that you give up your morals or your principles but in the sense that you're wise mm. that this situation may look a lot like that one but it's really different because of this different feature yeah. you know like if you're a parent you have two kids and you know, they are so alike in some ways, but so different in other ways. And one tone of voice works with one, one comment, but not with the other. And, you know, real realtors say location, location, location. Well, Cicero in talking about the therapy grief says timing, timing, timing. And you could say mm. something similar. That's about what context sensitivity we might say. That's about, um, wisdom of understanding other people and how to, mm make it how to be true to yourself on this occasion that doesn't mean you know if you're taking a test you don't plagiarize that's an absolute <laughs> um, yeah. otherwise you go to the honor board and i've had those this term <laughs> uh -huh. if you're if you're writing you observe citation rules you know you don't that's just how it goes and those are pretty well set um mm. so and I, I think they, they think about that as well. So honors, integrity, or, um, they're big words. And in practice, they're messy, me mm. messy applications, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I think that, yes, life is so so gray, not just black and white. I, I guess I, there's one thing that I'm thinking about here, which is that it, your your example of say the um, the 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 military person who engages in warfare and then after the fact finds out that it was a terrible decision where they originally thought that it was correct, it, it seems to me like uh, this kind of way of thinking needs to, like we need to bring our attention back to uh, um, the point of decision. What tools do we use as our disposal at the point of decision? Because one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is that it, it 
it, if, if you read history, what you learn is that humans are pretty terrible at predicting what the outcomes of their actions will be. Like we always imagine that we're acting out of the best interests or the highest good or um, like we're making the most reasonable decision. But then, you know, even after you die, there are going to be ripple effects that may be completely contrary to what you ever would have thought would happen if you made, made a different decision. So, uh, I understand that there's that humans are terrible at predicting, <laughs> um, and 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 I wonder how how we how we reconcile that fact with say a pursuit of wisdom or virtue or truth, uh, and it seems to me like the path is to bring it back and say, well, listen, uh, I I need I need to, okay, no, I'm going to take this in a different direction. You talk about post traumatic growth in the book a lot. And this might be a good segue into this topic because I don't know if that is a term that you coined specifically uh, on your own, but um, can you talk to me about that post-traumatic growth? Because it it seems to me it has a lot to do with this idea that you believe you're acting in the best interest in the start. And then you realize that what you did, for example, was not uh, uh, the correct decision and you see. Okay. So let me, um, let me take up your lead there. Thank you for that. So um, in the book, I give an example, uh, not mine, it's from um, Chris Chivers, CJ Chivers, uh, uh, New York Times um, uh, uh, Pentagon car- war correspondent and, pre- and a Marine, previously Marine. Um, spent a lot of time, 20 years um, in the field deploying. And in some of the last um, deployments, he uh, was with uh, a guy named Lane McDowell, Naval Aviator, Cracker Jack Naval Aviator. Lane McDowell um, had an, in Kosovo, uh, we were flying, Americans were flying very, very high to protect our flights. That meant visibility wasn't always great. And so he, uh, in one case, dropped a huge, uh, payload, enormous uh, two bombs. Um, and, and his plane was diverted a little bit um, because Serbian forces were, were coming in at the moment. And so, you know, it, at the very last minute, Intel um, imaging might have been a little grainy and the Intel may have been a little off. But anyway, he still thought he was pretty doing pretty well. When he got back onto the aircraft carrier, it, there's a big screen and they do um, uh, after incident brief, um, debriefing. And he sees that there's a carport and there are small bikes next to the carport or under the carport. And his stomach sinks. He's pretty sure he uh, hit a house with kids. The Navy, the Pentagon, you know, do their after incident investigation, but nothing much happens. But Lane McDowell holds himself responsible. He does his after incident debriefing and he's guilty on in his view. Okay, there's a guy with a conscience. He has a young child himself. And um, so that's mid 90s, when we were in Kosovo, early 90s. Uh, he's now in Iraq and he's not keen on flying. And he has flashbacks, he has dreams. Of, and one of the dreams, he goes into a building, it's really dusty. You know, you can imagine if you've just bombed a house, there's wires dangling, s- cement falling everywhere. And in the, in the corner, he sees this little child huddled up and he cradles the child like this, but the child's missing the back of his head, but the front of his head is there. And he recognizes the child as his own. Landon is his name. That's a, a fairly classic case of, of flashback, um, but it's mm. not just a fear, it's a moral injury because he feels, he holds himself accountable. You know, maybe the Pentagon doesn't hold him accountable, but he holds himself accountable. And this is not uncommon in the military. I mean, they wield leth- lethality, high stakes situation with lethality. Now, you might say, what could the Stoics possibly tell us about this? The guy shouldn't feel anxious. He didn't do anything wrong or not. He's not really culpable. You know, it goes all the way up the chain of command and all the levels of 
people that are feeding him intelligence in a very, this is what I mean, a very gray situation, Mm. highly complex, no black and white there. Split second decisions, you know, a little like policing in some ways, but, you know, complicated in its own way Mm. with much, with very, very powerful weaponry. So he, um, you know, this haunts him for a long time. And I was thinking, what could the Stoics tell us? Stoics say, you know, no anxiety, no distress. There may be good versions of all the emotions of, of desire and of, you can have rational desire, you can have rational fear called caution and you can have rational pleasure called joy. No, no distress because you never do anything wrong if you're a sage. But, the, so, but none of us are sages. We just mm. are, it, you know, and they don't, Socrates wasn't a sage, Cato wasn't a sage. Um, so I, you know, and this is a challenge that Cicero poses straight to Cleantes. He says, you tell me that anxiety and distress of this sort isn't a good thing. I, this is in Tusculan Disputations. I say to you that it's an impulse to virtue, at least the, the kind I'm speaking about right now, mm. where there's a sense of shame and guilt. And the, there's a big trope in the Greek literature about Alcibiades. He, the, I mean, I love teaching the symposium. He rolls into the symposium, the last speech. Socrates is his beloved teacher. But, but Alcibiades, you know, he, he, he screws the, uh, excuse me, he's, you know, he, he, he harms the Athenians, essentially. Um, um, and, but still wants Socrates to think he's wonderful. And he feels shame in front of Socrates. You're the only person in the world that I can feel ashamed of. You didn't think I could, but you make me feel ashamed. You make me cry. The tears Mm. of Alcibiades. And Cicero refers to that. What do we say, Cleantes, one of the old Greek Stoics, about the tears of Alcibiades? Isn't Isn't that the impulse to virtue itself? So I run with that in the sense, sometimes shame is a moral emotion of distress. It's, mm. it's a post-reflection. You say, you know, maybe you didn't get it right the first time and you reflect afterwards. And so you want, it's, it's a moment of moral progress. And mm. Seneca himself actually talks about this sort of thing a lot. I think in um, Hercules Rages is a play and Hercules, you might say is a warrior, but he's, you know, the strongest man alive and or mytho- mythologically at least, and he bursts through the out of Hades into the world for a homecoming to see his family. But Juno has blinded him and pushed him into a, a deluded stupor, so he kills his his um, his wife and his children. Having killed his wife and children, he then comes to and he wants to kill himself. I mean, what else could he do? It's horrible. Mm. And one of his his father says, or his friend says, use your heroic courage. That's the line. And then to show mercy to yourself. And then his father says, Mm. the guilt was not yours, but your stepmother's Juno, um, who had put the um, blinded his eyes. And that's a real lesson because I, many of us do things for which we feel horrific afterwards. They may not rise to that level and we may not be military men and women. Uh, We we just might have neglected something we should have done not neglected in our lives or we might have aligned ourselves in ways that we now regret. We aligned ourselves with people who were less than fully honorable or the like and we want to make amends. And so... Mm. I think that's remarkable. And then, in the, you know, in the, this is often where we need to take the perspective of the other. In this case, a friend, a beloved father, find our resilience in the social connection, lean on them to build ourselves up, not retreat, but ask for help and be, be given help. And that, yeah. you know, make sure we're connected to each other. If we're disconnected, we're like a branch or a limb lying alone on a Mm. battlefield, separated from our corpse. I think that's a really, you know, I I take that as a really powerful lesson, not often brought out. Um, And to me, that's sort of a healthy modern stoicism. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I I really like uh, this idea of 
almost reframing uh, shame and guilt as this impulse to virtue or, you know, in, and, 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 and is that, is that your kind of um, approach with this post-traumatic growth in that you try to, you would try to get somebody to, to reframe it and say, well, okay, well, there's obviously a, a good place that this is coming from, which is means that I'm, I'm wanting to return to a sort of virtuous state or, or, or how, how do you approach that? Like, how do you, how do you take somebody through uh, a post-traumatic experience well, and get I'm them not to reframe th- it? So I'm not a therapist and I mm. wouldn't even begin to mm. give moral, to give counsel in that regard. Mm. Um, but I can tell you how those who are clinical psychologists, researchers, and actual clinicians um, working with veterans in the situation. It happens to be veterans because mil- moral injury, which is what we were discussing, mm. was most um, um, uh, um, fully di- uh, studied in the military context. No surprise mm. why, um, but it could happen anywhere. You could uh, be the victim of, of um, acts of nature. Um, Mm. but you don't know where to go and who to turn to. And you turn on yourself as you should have been able to escape. You should have done things. You can be a firefighter, um, who loses his children. That's one of the examples, not his children, but lose who can't save children. That's an example Mm. in the book. So this is the way, um, colleagues who work with others, um, do it, but there are many, many paths. There's no single, uh, therapeutic, um, silver bullet. That's yeah. just not the way ever to think about um, uh, therapy. Uh, what works yeah. for some, it doesn't work for others. So it's a, a, a very open palette um, of, of experimenting. And much of it is in the magic of the relation, not magic, that's a bad word, the rapport of the relationship. Mm. So um, the VA sometimes uses a, a method called um, empty chair. It's sort of, it's very obvious in a certain way. You bring an empty chair into a room. Um, it could be, uh, a, a buddy who you couldn't save. It could be uh, an enemy who you killed, but you just feel horrible about it. Hmm. And you, um, and you, um, but it also could be a, a, um, a moral authority in your life, someone who's benevolent, but also is a moral figure in your life. And you try to see yourself through their eyes. Would hmm. they hold you as? culpable as you hold yourself. This is in the case of, mm. of, of, of viewing yourself as a transgressor, for example, yeah. of, of having um, committed some sort of moral wrong, real or apparent. Would you view yourselves in, in that same way? So it is a gestalt switch, mm. a cognitive shift, um, and or vice versa. Would you hold them as accountable if they were in a in a uh, in a horrible place like you are as you're holding yourself so um, adam smith who's a um, scottish enlightenment philosopher of the 18th century um was very influenced by the stoics as many in the um uh, of that period and much earlier were and he called it trading places in fancy um yeah. changing places in fancy it's a, a swap of perspective and that's yeah. um you know and then in some cases in therapy uh, protocols I've seen writing letters to victims um, is a way of asking for forgiveness. It could be 50 years later. Mm. You know, we're at about 50 year mark for Vietnam and some Vietnam vets are writing letters as, as a way of healing. So yeah. I think healing comes in all different fashions. In some cases, it's artwork. It could be um, masks that you make that show art. Um, and the, the suffering you feel inside, but you can't put it in words. Words are not for everyone. Music yeah. is for some people. You're, you, you, put, you know, dealt in music. Mm. Music is for some. Artwork yeah. is for some. Da- I dance, dance is for some. Yeah. I think it comes in many, healing comes in many places, but I don't think it's often a retreat on the mountaintop. Yeah. Not, not, not for many. Yeah. 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 Well, there, there, there seems to be a theme as well running through, uh, the kind of questions that you're asking when you say you put the chair there and you imagine somebody that meant, you know, a, a person you respect or a victim and would they judge you as harshly? Uh, I think of a quote from Epictetus uh, to paraphrase it. He says um, that true personal growth comes from a mixture of self-scrutiny and self-kindness. 
And it sounds like that's that's mm, almost yes. an approach that you're taking there as well, which is, and and talk to me about how important that is because I, you know, obviously I deal more more in just a standard coaching approach with what I do with my clients, but I, I've often found that that's the perfect starting point with people because often what they might come to me for is they're too hard on themselves. You know, they're actually kind of beating themselves up about, you know, well, I'm not this and I'm not that. And they're comparing themselves to everybody else. And I often find myself starting by saying one of the most important things I can do to you is to help you to be kinder to yourself and to, to, to maybe um, even let yourself off the hook every so often for, for some of the things that you judge yourself too harshly. Of. Can you talk about the importance of that? I think it's critical. Um, uh, Self-punishment. Well, look, we come from a tradition in which there's a lot of self-punishment. Mm. Um, guilt is, um, is was out there um, a, a long time ago. And sometimes it's useful. I mean, there are a lot of people mm. who don't feel guilty who should feel guilty. I'll say yeah. it right out loud. <laughs> there's a moral, there are a lot of moral wantons out there, you know, mm. or amoral, people who lack morals, who yeah. should feel a lot more guilt than they feel. And there are a lot of atrocities that have been committed. Um, whether you're in war or on on streets, in violent confrontations, um, murders, um, who should feel very very guilty. So guilt free mm. is not for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's and that's why it adds the self scrutiny, right? It's got to be a balance. You've got to tell yourself both both stories, right? Well, they're just, you know, but not everyone reflects at all. I mean, <laughs> we have to be honest. Uh, we're especially now living in worlds in which a lot of people don't reflect at all. It's mm-hmm. really, a, you know, a, a lot about me and me and me. So, um, but of the morally reflective and conscient, not, you know, and, and con- self-conscious and conscientious persons, people with consciences, let's put it that way. Um, some can be too hard because shame is a very... Um, a, it's a very crippling emotion. It disables you um, in a sense, you know, the Greeks used to say, you hide your face. Um, you wanna, um, you're, you're ashamed before others, um, you know, but we don't need an audience to feel shame. We can feel it on our own. So hmm. um, we do need to sometimes um, get over it, but we often need to understand why we're feeling that way. For In some cases, if it really is a, a wrongdoing, then there are many ways in which we need to, I mean, actively, not just thinking, get out there and do things. So reparations, um, re- repair of the world. If, if you um, were in wars or, or in environments, policing, um, uh, firefighting, um, nursing, uh, managerial levels where you think you really you know, stiffed the staff in some way without giving them adequate means or, 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 or supports, then do something to change that. This is the world. So I do think sometimes it's the world. So I will cut back to that point. You know, stoic wisdom is not just about building step-by-step me so that I can have my best life and then step into the world. That's not, we're never, we never, never, never not in the world. Any parent knows you're in the world. And the moment that kid comes into your life and you're with that kid and she, or he's with you and you're out there tangoing um, mm. and tra- trying to figure out how to tango. So, mm. and you know, therapy is of course dynamic. You're, you're in the world. So the, Ways in which we repair aren't just ourselves, but maybe it involves um, going somewhere where that reminds you of the place where something horrible happened that you were implicated in in some way, Mm. Um, but maybe not right away. In the book, I talk about um, a firefighter who he's really, I thought, a remarkable Dutch firefighter. I don't know if you remember the story, but in a small village um, outside, um, everything's sort of outside Amsterdam in in the Netherlands. Um, And um, it was Christmas Eve and there were, there was a fire. He was called to and his guys, four guys had already arrived there. Uh, It was a house over a Chinese restaurant. And um, the guys, there were four of them who really wanted to go in, but they weren't sure they could safely get in. And Art, um, the captain 
survey the scene and there was no way that they could go in. And it was also a certain amount of time after which, uh, during which, uh, uh, for which the fire had burned and it was unclear that it, it would be for any real good. He would not allow his own guys to do the after report. It was the police that did the after report because it was too close to them. I mean, that's actually protocol, I think. It's just protocol that uh, if you're on the scene and involved, you're not the ones that do the after incident mm. report of exactly what happened. And so time is important as well. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and all the supports that would go with your professional organization and being able to um, handle this and others that have gone through this before. I, you know, mm. I, I think it, it does take a community in some ways to be able to do some of the work that some of some folks around us do. Um, yeah. And, you know, and if you don't have decent managers um, or you can't change the system in some way that's stacked against you, um, or you don't have decent wages or you don't have a decent healthcare system to support you um, as you do hard work, then, then you can't. You can't do it on your own. So uh, I think these are all things you have to think about when you're thinking about how do I flourish? How do I thrive? What does it take for me to engage in the world? And the, the Stoics were not, you know, Seneca. Epictetus had a certain stance. He was enslaved. And so he, and he never had any interest in politics. Hmm. So that was his thing. Marcus Aurelius had a big interest in politics, <laughs> you know, but he took, he, he, he took comfort in the, you know, the reflections of someone not in his position. He had the, yeah. and, and he had, he had the privilege of that in a certain way, you know, mm. uh, of thinking of how humbling it would be in a certain way. Seneca was not unprivileged. He lived in the halls of opulence and, you know, and he hid himself regularly to figure out how to be, how to kill the demon in a certain way. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't think he thought it was a demon in a certain way, all these, yeah. all these riches and banquets mm. and opulence around him, but he also had a conscience and, um, and he wrote remarkable letters. So I think Stoics are complex, mm. you know, and I think that's why they're so darn appealing, frankly, yeah. because they are living in messy worlds of high stake politics often where what they say isn't often what they do. <laughs> and some of the meditations, they are too harsh on oneself. I wouldn't want to meditate regularly the way Seneca says he meditates. Mm -hmm. It would be like slapping my, you know, like stupid, stupid. <laughs> Why'd you do that all the time? You know, a little Buddhist meditation is a little is a good balance to yeah. some of to some of the chastening. And Freud had a good term for it. You know, the superego can be very harsh. Mm. Yeah. You know, and and that is in some ways the superego that's being inherited from um, the Greco-Roman world. Um, yeah. You know, the the the, the reason. Yeah. You know, this is, this is, I guess, um, I, I only really have one more question for you. Uh, I want to be mindful of time here, but this is, I guess, where I think you really come into your stride in this, in this book, which is that you really add to the, well, th there's a lot of books about stoicism out there. Right. And so something a that lot. I think that you, that, <laughs> something that I think that you add to the table is that perspective of, uh, what does it mean to say grow through trauma? What does it mean that we are living in a very messy gray world and that this philosophy is also quite gray and messy, but, but, you know, how do we reconcile those, uh, the, those elements? And I guess I wanted to ask you, you know, with all the books on stoicism out there, what, what do you believe you bring to the table in this book that, that you might not find elsewhere? I think two things. One is the emphasis on, the social fabric of life mm -hmm. and sh the ways in which we share humanity through reason and emotion. Emotions are um, cognitive on the stoic view uh, with each other, however different 
we look, however other we are, and however far away we are, mm. um, and that we're committed to that project of connecting through our humanity. Let us cultivate humanity is how Seneca ends on anger. So that's one thing. I don't bring just narrow self-help. There are enough self-help books out there. That's mm. not what I'm into. I teach ethics, and that's really where my heart is. The second thing is, I think some of the uh, techniques that the Stoics give us for pressing the pause button on impulsive impressions that lead to uh, irrational action are ones we need to take to heart for how we think about our world and how we process the world. When you when Sto when Seneca says in On Anger, chapter uh, book two. Um, Monitor your att attention. Um, monitor the impulse that's coming, the the uh, um, impulsive impression that's coming in, so you don't necessarily assent to it. Um, nip it. I'll use my language. Nip it in the bud if it will mm. lead to an irrational action. And so that's how he thinks we control emotions. Sometimes he, there's a lot, a lot of volition and will, maybe too much. But that's a really important way of thinking about how to. Think slowly when we think too fast. Press mm. the pause button. Are some of your impressions that are coming in biased in ways you're not even conscious of? Are you seeing someone as insulting you or as, uh, as angering you or as um, an object of hatred in a way you're not even aware of? Mm. Press the pause button. And stop that grabby kind of way of reacting or that fearful way of, 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 um, of moving away in disgust or with re re revulsion. That's what I think I bring to the table. That these are um, these are group, these are not light hacks. They're they're us, they're they're group hacks, you might say, for us all living together in mm. a more connected and I hope just an equitable way yeah that's yeah. that's that's the sort of the moral of of um yeah that is an ancient lesson that is what the ancient greek and romans give to us when they're at their best it's how to mm. live in a just society it's how mm. to live equitably if not equitably how to uh, act beneficently toward one another how to show gratitude um and how to even interact with emotions. Seneca's terrific on the face, furrowed brows or gifts. You know, it's like giving gifts with stones. It's like stone soup, he says. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah. I think all these are ways in which we, we look at each other as building community together uh, through reason, humanity, and with psychological habits of mind that get us in better places than we are now. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm going to include links to uh, where people can go and grab your book. And uh, I highly recommend that they do. <laughs> Stoic Wisdom out now. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you so much, Simon. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Hey there, YouTubers. I just wanted to let you know that if you love this episode and you'd like many more just like it, then you can head to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. There you'll get access to exclusive episodes that haven't been released yet, as well as many other benefits. Also, if you'd like to work one-on-one -on -one with me in my coaching practice, then you can head to simonjedrew.com forward slash coaching. Talk to you soon.